Good morning. Before we get started this morning, uh, Carrie and I just wanted to let you know how blessed we are to be part of Wellington Church. Uh, one of our biggest prayer requests prior to moving here was that we'd find a great church to be able to plug into and be part of, and God more than came through for us. If you attend here normally, you know what I'm talking about, uh, because we're so blessed to have a wonderful group of leaders, um, staff, and a godly pastor in Wayne Holcomb, who uh, rightly divides and teaches us the truth of God's Word. And we need to make sure we don't take that for granted because we really truly receive a blessing through him. By the way, be in prayer for Wayne and Richard Whitaker on their trip to India and for their safe return home. All that being said, uh, the initial Blackhawk you just saw in that very sobering video would have been my aircraft, call sign Super 67. It was one of eight Blackhawks used in the mission that day and one of four to insert Ranger blocking forces around our objective area. As a result of that mission, in less than 24 hours, the United States had 18 dead Americans, many more wounded, and five aircraft that were shot down or badly damaged. But I will tell you that over a thousand Somalis were killed that afternoon, that night, into the next morning. And that one mission, although it happened over 20 years ago now, still has implications on the world's geopolitical stage, and we're still feeling the effects and ramifications of that. October 3rd, 1993, in Mogadishu, Somalia, was one of the biggest wake-up calls of my life. Yet God patiently waited another 14 years and humbled me every which way but loose to finally get my attention. Well, this morning I have a different mission altogether. I want to be as transparent as I can with you. I want to share with you some of my experiences from Somalia certain aspects of my life and my faith journey, what God has put on my heart. So that there's uh, no confusion, I'm not here to talk about religion, but I'll gladly share with you the importance of relationships. Be honest though, most of the time I feel like the last guy in the world to be as qualified to come up and share the things of the Lord. You know why? Because I know me. And I know the things that I deal with in my thoughts, my words, and my deeds on a daily basis. A friend of mine told me some time back, he said, Jeff, you can't worry about that. God calls the equipped. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So I feel called to get up in front of people and share my testimony, what the Lord has done to me. Because honestly, if I didn't believe what I'm going to share with you this morning, I wouldn't be up here wasting my time or yours because I could be doing a million other things. So I'm all in. I'm sold out. And I believe God has something that he wants to share with us here this morning. I'm honored to be here with you. Somalia. In case you're not aware how our involvement in that country began, it started out as a humanitarian effort called Operation Restore Hope under George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, prior to his leaving office and Bill Clinton taking over. Things went bad almost immediately upon our arrival in the country when armed conflict broke out between U.S. and U.N. forces and the various Somali militias to include that of warlord Muhammad Farid Idid. Muhammad Idid was the head of the Habergeter clan in Mogadishu. He was the most powerful warlord in that city and probably for the country of Somalia for that matter. And because of this guy, Task Force Ranger was formed, consisting of Delta Force, Army Rangers, and the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, or the 160th, the unit that I was part of. Our operation was called Gothic Serpent, and our overall mission was to go after this guy and his organization. We started training in March and deployed in August with approximately 500 men and 20 aircraft. We hit the ground running and conducted our first mission the very day we arrived in country and had conducted several missions prior to October 3rd in what military historians have called the Battle of the Black Sea. On October 3rd, we lifted off at 3.30 in the afternoon now, one thing I want you to be aware of, the 160th nickname is called the Night Stalkers. And we had a motto, death waits in the dark. In case you're not aware of it, the 160th Army and Military Special Operations United States, and the military for that matter, we own the night. Nobody conducts nighttime operations better than the United States. But while we were in country, intel dictated when and where we would go. And that day, it happened to be in broad daylight, right into the middle of the hornet's nest. 
So soon after our insertion, the first Black Hawk Super 6-4 was shot down. Both pilots were killed. Not too long after that, Super, uh, excuse me, Super 6-1 was shot down. Both pilots were killed. Not too long after that, Super 6-4 was shot down, and Mike Durant, the pilot in command of the aircraft, was captured. Some of you may remember that from the news, and his entire crew were killed. Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, two Delta snipers who voluntarily went in, outgunned and outnumbered to try to secure that site until help could arrive, as you saw in the video, were both killed. Later on, they'd be posthumously awarded Medal of Honor for their actions that day, and they'd be the first since Vietnam to receive the nation's highest award, military award. I remember finally shutting my engines down at 10.30 the next morning, and our base was still in turmoil and recovering from the events of that night. But I knew later, and we would discuss in painful detail in an after-action review, or what we called an AAR, every time we competed a mission. When we conducted those AARs, depending on who ran them, sometimes they would ask us to give us three sustains and three improves. Three, what do we do wrong? What do we need to fix? And three, what do we do right? Well, I just remember walking away from Somali with three lessons learned, and that's what I'm going to share with you here this morning. The first one is this. Never underestimate your enemy. Because a loosely organized militia of Somalis with AK-47 machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, handheld radios, and burning tires were able to kill, injure, inflict damage upon, and hinder the operations of the best trained, best equipped, and most capable special operations forces in the world, bar none. Like I said, we lost 18 Americans that day, and I will tell you, in my opinion, had it not been for the caliber of guys that were on, that, on the ground that day, I believe the outcome could have been much, much worse. My second lesson is this. Have a plan and plan your contingencies more than one deep. In other words, be prepared. In the military, there's a saying, the plan is only the foundation for change. Having no contingencies is like gambling. Because things usually happen, and they usually happen at the wrong time, and I'm sure many of us have our own little personal stories that we can share in that regard. When we started our training, we knew that there were so many scenarios that were going to come at us that we had to be flexible, that we used a systematic approach to accomplish a mission, including scenario-based templates, a graduated training plan, and our standard operating procedures, or SOPs. We used templates to mirror the various situations that we would come across because we knew that we'd have a limited time to execute the mission because this guy was in and out all the time in all kinds of different places. So these scenarios we'd pull out, we had several of them, but to give you an idea, a broad brush, we knew that we'd get intel on this guy that he'd be in a vehicle or a, a convoy of vehicles, uh, maybe a, a single building or a compound of buildings, and then you add into that an urban or a rural environment. Um, you could see where we had to be very fluid and very flexible in order to get to this guy. Our graduated training plan included, the, included what we called the crawl, walk, and run method of training. In the crawl phase, you basically make sure that you have the, found, the fundamentals down. And any good coach will let you know that you don't have a team if you don't have fundamentals. So we made sure everybody was current on all the little soldiering tasks that they, they needed to be proficient in. The second phase, we'd go ahead and just dissect the mission into little pieces and start. Uh, I always have a saying, you know, if you have to eat an elephant, don't eat the whole thing at one time. Just take one bite at a time and don't look at it. And that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what we had to do because there were so many moving parts and pieces that we di dissected these missions into little pieces that we got those down. Finally, in the run phase, we conducted every one of those scenarios from start to finish to include contingency operations. We were busy. The glue that held that all together, however, was our standard operating procedures. And SOPs, some of you may have employee handouts or safety manuals or whatever you go, go by. They tell you what to do from start to finish. An SOP is simply this. They are core plans that you commit to memory and use in the absence of a brief change. 
In other words, if you don't tell me anything else, I'm going to go ahead and refer back to what the SOP tells me. When I left the 160th in 2006 and I retired, this is the unclassified version of our standard operating procedures. It's about as thick as my Bible. And I will tell you that if you wanted to be a, a, a valid participant in the mission, you would need to know about 25% of this manual cold. So when things happen, you could act, actually operate according to what was stated in the SOP. One of the things that book talks about is fast rope procedures. And you saw that at the beginning of the video where they throw the ropes out and the guys uh, slide down them to get on the target area. Fast roping is a very fast way to get a lot of guys on an objective area very quick when you don't have the ability to land there. It's basically a flexible fireman's pole, for lack of a better term. It's a rope anywhere from 30 to 90 feet in length and about three or three and a half inches in diameter. And guys literally just grab it, slide down, and go. Well, this SOP tells us how we rig those ropes in the aircraft. What are some of the emergency procedures? We have a problem with someone on the rope or the ropes hanging out or whatever. It also tells us how we communicate as a crew when we're conducting fast rope operations. So to give you an example, when we take off to a target, normally we'd have a 10, a 6, and a one minute call, then a standby, and then the ropes, ropes, ropes. So how that would normally work is the guy flying the controls would see his target, let everyone know they had his target in sight. As he gets close and he starts decelerating, he tells everybody to stand by. As soon as that aircraft is stabilized at a hover above the target area, he'll give the command of ropes, ropes, ropes. That tells the crew chief in the back to point to the customer and say ropes. Because that guy in the back knows, taken by blind faith, that he's where he's supposed to be when he's supposed to be there. He throws the ropes out. The crew chiefs let us know the ropes are out. He starts sending his guys down, ropers are away, and when they're all on the ground doing their things, they'll look, make sure no one's on them, they'll cut the ropes, and let, let, the, let us know the ropes clear left and right, so the guy flying can rotate the aircraft and go and get out of the way. I want you to remember that for later on. As I had stated earlier, we had conducted several missions prior to October 3rd where no one was shot up, shot down, or injured. And I believe that we got overconfident and complacent and did not continue to adjust our plans as necessary or improve upon our contingencies. So when things went bad, we found that we had no reserve forces in place and identified to either go out in vehicles to the fight or, or pick up zones identified where we could pick up those troops and take them out to where we, to the action was. We also had no resupply of ammunition or medical uh, supplies prepackaged and in place ready to go. Therefore, we became a reactive instead of a proactive force. It's amazing what hindsight does for you. We're going to discuss these first two lessons learned in detail here in a little bit, a little bit more. My third lesson is this. Be careful of what you wish for. You might just get it. Special operations in combat was what I wished for. I wanted to be in the center of the action. The only problem, things according to our minds or our imaginations usually never work out, uh, on our terms anyway. And some of you ask, why in the world would you want to go to combat? Well, like most guys, I wanted to see how I'd handle myself. I wanted to see, you know, would I have the metal to measure up to the guys next to me, and I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself, and I wanted to be part of things that influence the world versus sitting on the sidelines and watching life go by. So when I found out about the 160th in Special Operations Aviation, I got excited real quick and was willing to do whatever and however to get in and fit in and make it into this organization. So I started training, working out, and preparing for an assessment into the 160th. And I will tell you that I was not disappointed. I had the opportunity to do a lot of great training, travel the world, and work with all kinds of amazing and talented people and organizations. I was able to participate in things I like to refer to as high speed, low drag. And uh, at the time it was kind of fun running around, running around the world with your hair on fire, so to speak. After a few years, I began to think pretty highly of myself, thinking, I'm all that in a bag of chips. I'm pretty awesome, just ask me. Now when I get up in the morning, I realize all I've really done over the years is eaten all that in a bag of chips. and. Uh, I still wonder why they let me in that organization to begin with, to be quite honest. 
with all that cool stuff I got to do traveling and being on the road with the guys and partying like a rock star in far off places. Uh, got into a lot of drinking and, and I honestly got involved in a lot of uh, unsavory indiscretions, to put it politely. I was told of and accepted the mindset when I got in the unit, Jeff, what goes on the road stays on the road. Some of you may have seen that commercial in Vegas, what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. We know what it implies, we know that it's a bunch of junk. But I got caught up in all that. The whole time I was doing these wrong things, uh, I grieved internally and I knew I was doing the wrong things, but at the same time I was having fun and didn't want to change, if you know what I mean. Um, it's because I was having fun and I was selfish. I thought of myself and myself only. You see, I also had a real big fear of failure, a fear of rejection, and therefore a huge desire to be accepted by my peers. So I automatically conformed to what I perceived in my mind the culture and the unit to be and compromised myself out of fear and my own selfishness and sacrificed the most important people and things in my life for people and things that should never have mattered that much. Years later, I got divorced for many reasons, but the brunt of that blame rests on the shoulders of the man in front of you this morning. I lived by a double standard, expecting more from others than I was willing to give myself and being in judgment of those people who were doing these sinful things, and yet I'm a Christian. Let's face it. Sin can totally ruin you. It can ruin your family, your friendships, ruin your work, your work environment, but sin is fun. I used to kid around with guys and say, if you, have, if you don't think sin is fun, you haven't found the right one. I'm talking to a group of people here, so I know somebody here can identify with what I'm talking about. The problem is the fun is only temporary. The consequence is no to go away. The hurt, the pain, the suffering, the grief, and the scars that you inflict on yourself, on loved ones, on friends, on family, are never totally healed. You may be forgiven of those things and never do them again, but guess what? The scars are there. As life is not a rehearsal and there are no do-overs, the damage has been done. You see, I literally had a war going on with inside of me. I was trying to hold on to what was right in my own power, at the same time living like the devil. And I remember what a guy named Mike, not Mike Durant, a different Mike, one of the aviators there, came up to me one day and said, Jeff, you know, you're the only guy I know that can read the Bible one minute, look at Playboy the next. You're the only guy I know that can read the Bible one minute, look at Playboy the next. When people saw me, I wonder what they thought. There's the walking conundrum. I was confused. And I was absolutely miserable. And I made a lot of people around me miserable at the same time because that old saying, misery loves company, is absolutely true. I was lonely. It was a very long, lonely time in my life. I felt like I was trying to fit in with everyone, all the while feeling like I fit in with absolutely no one. After Somalia, I didn't want to be a pawn for anyone because I felt like we were used over there and, and had our hands tied and, and uh, we were not given an opportunity to have the success that we wanted and we left unfinished business when we left there that uh, I decided I was not going to be a pawn for the government or anyone else for that matter. So I got busy. I took all those energies from the Army and aviation and I started applying them into my personal life. And over a few years, I purchased 14 townhouses and opened three pizza places. I was no stranger to work, but I had a goal. I was going to be independent and no one was going to tell me what to do or demand things of me that I felt were unrealistic. I opened the third store and things were going pretty good and I was driving to it one day and I remember saying out loud in my car, God, I got it from here. Y'all know where this is going, right? It's not a good road. Two years later, I found myself in bankruptcy court because God was letting me know 
just who had what. Everything that I identified with my ego and my manhood was stripped from me. A marriage, businesses, money. Uh, I was going to be a flight lead. I was already an instructor pilot in the 160th. I was going to be a flight lead. I got kicked out of the unit after I got back from Fort Bragg. And it hit me by surprise. I, I didn't see it coming. But God took everything that I hung my hat on away from me to let me know who was in charge. It's interesting to note that in the Bible, James chapter 4, 13 and 14, the Bible says, Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you, don't know, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Even more poignant, in Mark 8, 36 and 37, it says this. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I usually ask questions where I go. A lot of them normally. What is it, if you're here today, what is it are you wishing for? What price are you willing to pay and are you possibly paying a price now? Or like me, have you paid a price? Take it from experience. Be careful of what you wish for. You might just get it. Let's go back to lesson one. Never underestimate your enemy. The verse God gave me for that lesson was this, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober and vigilant, as your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What about the enemy of our souls and how are we doing today? If you watch the news, read the headlines, get your news from the internet, TV, whatever, you know that our government, our society, our businesses, homes, churches, schools, and universities, you name it, the family. We have given up almost all of the ground of the enemy, in my opinion, and we are losing the war. Because in this day and age, we are marked and defined by war, strife, greed, pride, immorality, apathy, selfishness, political correctness, all kinds of vice, and so on and so forth. I could keep going on. Well, how did this all happen? Yeah, I know we're fallen creatures and we have an enemy. And a lot of times we're our own worst enemy. But I do know this, that one of the favorite tools of the devil is distraction. I like to refer to him as a master in the use of weapons of mass distraction. And uh, he's good at it. Because he knows that if he can keep our priorities away from where they should be, if he can keep us off of our knees and out of God's word, his job is much easier. We become easier for him to prey on. I know this because after joining the army and over time, I let the things of this world and my own agenda take first place in my life, I was distracted big time. And I was actually on a road of searching and looking and being, I'd say I'd almost found Christ before joining the army. Then I got distracted. So let me ask you, where are you in your life right now? What are your priorities and where are you heading? How are you being distracted and what ground have you given up to the enemy? Where are you in your life right now? What are your priorities and where are you heading? If you think about it, there are three very good questions that deserve an honest assessment and an honest answer because they directly, one, determine who you are, and secondly, it may determine where you're going. Let's look at lesson two. Have a plan and plan your contingencies more than one deep. In other words, be prepared. Are any of us here going through life on a gamble? It just makes good common sense to have backup plans in life for our finances. Maybe some of us have a second job or a skill that we possess, and I'm sure most of us have various forms of insurance that when things happen, the unexpected occurs, we can be proactive in life instead of reactive. Well, what about our spiritual life? Are we gambling with that? 
Are we proactive in a walk with God? Is God someone that we really want to relate to and we're relating to Him? And we're spending time in His Word and in His prayer. We're studying God's Word. Or is God our spiritual 911 that we only call when we're in trouble or we want something? Or maybe you're here this morning and someone invited you and you're skeptical about this whole Christianity thing, God and Jesus Christ. Or you're truly searching, you don't, don't really know what to make of God and His Son, what He's done for you. Or maybe just as a bunch of nonsense. You just want to hear some military guy. Well, I'm not standing up here this morning saying Jesus Christ should be treated as a backup plan or insurance policy. What I want to try to convey to you this morning is that He's the only real plan that you can build upon. He's the only one that you can have a foundation with. From there, you've got something to build upon. And if you don't think there is any room in your life for Jesus Christ, or if you're trying to put God into a, into a mold based upon your own intellect, your own opinion, your own feelings, are you willing to gamble eternity on that? And are you prepared and willing to face the consequences when you determine that you were wrong and you end up facing eternity without God because you approached Him on your terms and not according to the Bible. Because the Scriptures say in Romans 1, 20-22, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Jesus also said in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, believe it or not, or think it or not, According to the Bible, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Period. It's going to happen. You've got to get your mind around that. You've got to get your heart around that. I sure hope we're all on the right side of that equation. I really do. Because the difference between someone who knows the Lord and doesn't, I wouldn't wish one on my worst enemy and two, 1 Corinthians 1 9 says, Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor is coming in the mind of man what God has waiting for those who love him. It's going to be awesome, but the differences are going to be extreme. And I hope we're all on the right side of that equation. Trust me, I was a very frustrated man. Um, I was at my wit's end regarding my walk with the Lord. After retiring from the Army in 2006, I went to work for the State Department in Afghanistan on the poppy eradication program over there, and I had a lot of time to read my Bible and pray and seek God, and I went over there to have a come-to-Jesus meeting, to be quite honest with you. I was tired. I said, Lord, what's the deal? I remember when I was a teenager, I asked you into my life. Every time I opened a business, I dedicated it to you. Uh, I was at church. I'd go to church by myself most of the time. I did this, I did that. Notice it was I, 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 right? And I remember what the Lord in my room in Kandahar, Afghanistan, told me loud and clear. He said, Jeff, when are you going to get over yourself and surrender to me? It is my righteousness that makes you acceptable to me, not yours. When are you going to get over yourself and surrender to me? It is my righteousness that makes you acceptable to me, not yours. I cannot tell you what a relief that was to finally understand what that meant. Because I came from a very performance-driven background. One of the Night Stalker mottos was, Night Stalkers don't quit. It was an Eagle Scout, be prepared, Scout laws, all that, do, 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 be, 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 perform. And it got me absolutely nowhere. But I will tell you, the most important and best thing I ever did in my life, that moment on, I said, Lord, I am done. I surrender. I am nothing and I have nothing without you. I surrender you totally. And that's not wimpy. 
Because guess what? We're in no way qualified to ever stand up and man up and compare ourselves to God. I finally realized it was all about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross and that we have nothing to do with it as we cannot do any favors for God. So I stand before you this morning a forgiven man with peace and joy and contentment. And Galatians 5.20 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't always possess those all at the same time. I wish I did. Carrie wishes I did. (laughs) She sees me at my best and worst, that's for sure. But I know where I'm going when I kick the bucket. There's no doubt in my military mind because I have nothing to do with it. And for all it's worth, I would go through the good, the bad, and the ugly of Jeff Nicholas all over again. I'd repeat all the stuff in my past if I knew that it was going to lead me to Jesus Christ. Because I will not trade that for anything in the world. Nothing. Because like I said earlier, I am all in. And if I could give you one gift... I could do the Vulcan mind meld and heart meld with me to let me know what that actually looks like. Surrender is not a bad thing, especially when you're not qualified. And I can tell you for a fact that God is a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, and so on. You're never too lost. You're never too broken. You're never too down. You're never too screwed up that God can't come in and radically change your life and bless your socks off. I know this because I'm a living example of it. A subtitle on the Black Hawk Down movie poster is this, Leave No Man Behind. So my biggest mission in life really is that, is leave no man behind. But as in the battle that has raged ever since man has sinned in the garden, And that's the battle for your soul. I want you to refer back to that SOP that I talked to you earlier about. Irene, Irene, Irene was the call that came over the radio every time that we actually were in our craft running up and we launched. That was the launch code. So the flight would take off and everybody in their own individual chalk order, we'd link up over part of the airfield and by the time... uh, Uh, We got out over the Indian Ocean. The whole flight would be linked up with the Blackhawks and the Little Birds, everybody in their position, depending on the template that we had. That day we went off to the the west of Mogadishu, joined up over the ocean. We turned to the north, and from the north we swung south into the city of Mogadishu, going from north to south. And I remember we descended as a flight going over the northern portion of the city. And as soon as we did that, because this place was run down, there were no paved roads anymore. And we got down just above the buildings, dust enveloped the entire flight. I could not see the aircraft in front of me or to my left. And I could see through my chin bubble, and I could see the roofs of the buildings that were going by. At this time, we're kind of going fairly slow. And I said, don't worry, guys, I know where we're going. And I can't tell you how much longer after that my crew chief yelled at me and said, stop, stop the aircraft. The ropes are out. They're tangled on power lines. The ropes are out. How are they going to power lines? He said, well, I thought you said we're going to be okay. Since when does that mean ropes, ropes, ropes? So the ropes got on power lines. And then I had basically what amounts to is a wet spaghetti noodle below me trying to get them off the power lines onto a vehicle, then from off, the, off of a vehicle onto the road. Finally got that. I said, all right, send the guys out. We're short of the target. We're 50 meters short of the target. I didn't realize it. And we ended up being a block north of where we were supposed to be, short of our objective area. Because my target building was a white two-story building. I could take you there today with a corner notched out and an antenna and corner antenna in one northwestern part of the building, two blocks north of what was called the Olympic Hotel. My guys were supposed to go on that corner at the right time, and that did not happen. We finally got the ropes off. We joined the other aircraft, 
and holding. And right about then is when the aircraft started getting shot down. That were really the objective area. My crew chief said, and I need to smoke. As, and there is no smoking in Army aircraft. You know, there's 50 feet, like a little force field that surrounds Army aircraft. You're not allowed to smoke by them. So he said he wanted to smoke. It was like, well, go ahead. We're all going to die today anyway. And I wasn't being flippant or negative or anything like that. I just knew that that was a very real possibility based on what we were seeing and what we heard on the radio. I said, guys, all right, time out. I wish I could hit a freeze button. We need to talk as a crew. I said, I don't care what happens from here on out. As a crew, we're going to make sure that we do things according to our SOP. We're going to do it by the book. Do we all agree that we're going to operate as a crew, everything according to our training by the book? And we all agreed. So my question to you is this morning, what book are you going to do it by? I have learned from experience, this is my SOP now. This is the book I go by. And I highly recommend it, because if you don't know this, how are you going to be in the fight? You see, we sometimes plan for three or four days for a three or four hour mission. If we didn't know the SOP, we'd be dead in the water. We'd be perpetually planning and briefing and never accomplish a thing. So you can't be in the fight if you're not in this, because this is where we get our commander's intent. This is what we have to know. This is what equips us for battle. This is the only offensive weapon. If you read Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God, this is the only one that provides you an offense. Because my SOP says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are, no, there are no exceptions. We're all in that same boat. In Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin that we commit are death deserving to die, but it's a gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord that it saves us. Romans 5, 8. And I could go on a long time just on this verse. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you can look at all kinds of different biblical references. Before the world ever even showed up, God knew what he was going to do on the cross. And he knew he was going to need to do it because of us. But he had that all planned and figured out. So when you do something wrong, God isn't going, oh, did you just see what they did down there? Nothing takes him by surprise. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Jeff Nicholas variety of that is, hey, we're all, we're all screwed up. We all miss the mark. We all have nothing that we can give or do to be any better than anybody else. It's only by faith, it's only by God's grace that allows us in the door. In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you should be saved. And I didn't read anything in there about walking an aisle, jumping up and down, shouting hallelujah, praying on beads, getting dunked, getting sprinkled. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about surrender. And acknowledging the fact that you are short. You miss the target. Sin, by the way, is an ancient archery term used for missing the mark. You miss the target. You sinned. The early English adopted that uh, in archery tournaments. A little trivia. Wayne would be proud of me this morning. Romans 10, 13, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. Anyone. That door is wide open. But unfortunately, our pride and this little thing up here gets in the way. Because Jesus went on to say that broad and wide is a road that leads to destruction and many go down that way. But narrow is the gate that leads to everlasting life. I wish everybody here today would pick the narrow way. So are you here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? You have a relationship with Him. You've answered the call. I'm going to ask you for a couple favors. First, I'd like you to evaluate your walk 
Make sure that you're in your SOP and in prayer and get proactive. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because people where you live and work need to hear what you have to say. There is no days for tim timidity anymore. Those days are over. I might ask you to get connected. If you come here, there's all kinds of opportunities to get connected. There are discipleship programs, Bible studies, small groups, Awana, Sunday school, and many other ways that the staff and leaders can point you in direction. If you're here this morning and you don't think you have a relationship or you're not sure, please don't leave here today without talking to somebody. Please talk with me or Kevin or Brent or the elders. And get those questions answered because I tell you what, like I said in James, or like the Bible says in James, like I briefed you on earlier, life is but a vapor. It is here and gone before you know it. Wayne will be back soon and you can also schedule time with him if there's some things that you want to discuss with him. I'd encourage you to do that. I'm uh, really uh, appreciative of the offer. offer. I was really humbled and honored when Wayne asked me to uh, speak the next two weeks. If you are a glutton for punishment, I will be here next week. <laughs> Only for two weeks. So uh, anyhow, we're going to talk about the purpose of life. What in the world are we on this planet for to begin with? What are we supposed to do? Um, that's about it. I want to thank you, Wellington, and guests for allowing me to share with you this morning. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. We're going to sing, but uh, before we do that, let me go ahead and pray.